need. So this is uh, part three of a sermon series called Start Small. Uh, Little things become big things over time, and so we're just trying to help you develop some spiritual habits uh, in this season of your life that will hopefully uh, bring you to great benefit later on in life. James Clear said, almost everyone has similar goals. That's true, right? We all want to be healthy. We want to have better relationships. We want to win championships. We want to get promoted. You very seldom we meet anyone that says, uh, I want to struggle financially. I want to live paycheck to paycheck. I want to gain five pounds a year for the rest of my life. I want to be addicted to alcohol and drugs and vaping by the summer of 2022. Uh, I want to work a dead-end job for years. I want to live a passionless life and have lots and lots of regret. You just don't hear people say that because that's not generally what people want for their lives. Most people want to make the world a better place. They want to know God, and they want to be generous. So most of us, we have similar goals, but we experience vastly different results. And so what I've been kind of mulling over the last three weeks is, why? Why is that the case? If we all want the same things, why do some of us end up there and some of us do not? So what I've concluded is that we end up, when we end up doing something that we love, when we end up making the world a better place, when we end up in better relationships, when we end up healthier, it's because of a series of small decisions that we've made throughout our life up to that point. It's hardly ever like one big decision. It's usually a bunch of, a bunch of small choices that create habits in our lives that help us get to where we want to be. When we end up struggling financially, when we end up addicted, when we end up passionless and filled with regret, it's oftentimes because of a series of small decisions that we have made throughout our life that end us in a a place that we don't want to be. So the journey to failure, that's what we're going to approach this as today, The, the journey to failure is typically because of a series of small but very poor choices. So I'm going to show you one poor choice in the Bible. There are many. Um, I love the Bible. It's very relatable. A lot of the characters that we consider heroes were absolute failures in certain parts of their lives. And so very relatable things that we can all kind of, kind of experience in our own lives. These people experience them as well. But we're going to talk about a guy named, by the name of Samson. Anybody ever heard of Samson? All right, strongest dude ever. Um, Samson in Judges chapter 16, verse 1, it says, Samson went to Gaza where he saw a prostitute, and he went to bed with her. So Samson was born with this absolutely incredible potential. He was the strongest person on earth. He was basically the incredible hawk. He was Thor. He was those guys except real. (laughs) He was a real live version of a superhero. He had incomparable strength, but his life fell apart because of a series of bad decisions that led to the development of a very bad habit, a habit that would haunt him for the rest of his life. See, in this scripture, we learn that he walked to Gaza. Gaza was the home base of the Philistines, which was, that was Israel's arch enemies. That's, that's where Goliath came from. 
It would have been cool if uh, Samson ever faced Goliath, but they were on two different timelines, unfortunately. But um, the, you have these Philistines that absolutely hated Israel, and they wanted the promised land all to themselves. So they're, they're enemy number one. And being a, a Jewish man, it was very odd that Samson would walk all the way to Gaza. We also know that Gaza is 25 miles from Samson's hometown of Zorah. So I went to calculatorsite.com because I know he didn't drive his car there. Uh, so I wanted to see how many steps he actually took to get to Gaza. And according to calculator.com, uh, calculatorsite.com, it says that he would have had to take 56,300 steps to go from his hometown all the way to Gaza to meet this woman. Seems silly, right? To walk all that way just to commit this sin, but lust is a, a powerful motivator. It's destroyed many homes. Uh, Samson didn't get into trouble accidentally. It, it all started with one step after the other. A series of poor decisions. 56,300 poor decisions, poor steps that took him to this city where he committed this sin and developed a, a very bad habit. So week one, we, we talked about the fact that we all need habits. We need good God-honoring spiritual habits. And the ones I challenged you to start to develop were prayer, obedience, and worship. Prayer, obedience, and worship. If you can just start the habit of prayer, if you can start the habit of obedience, which means you read the Bible and you know what God says and you do what God says. So if you can start the, the habit of prayer, the habit of obedience, the habit of worship, if you can be begin to protect your Sabbath day to, to be a part of a worship service, then this is going to help your, your life. And then in week two, we talked about how you have to develop a system to get you toward those goals. They don't just happen automatically. You can't just set a goal and expect to meet the goal. You have to have a system that's going to help you get to that goal. And so I challenged you to develop some habits that are easy and obvious. And then today in the final part of this series, I want to challenge you to, to not start a habit, but to break a habit. I would assume in a room this size that most of us have uh, some bad habits that we need to break. So I want you to, right now, just where you're seated, ask yourself, if you're watching online, just, just ask yourself, what, what is a habit that I need to break? What unhealthy, unhelpful, ungodly habit do I need to break today? That's where our verse James 121 comes from. He says, get rid of every filthy habit and wicked conduct. Submit to God and accept the word as he plants it in your hearts, which is able to save you. James says that you're not going to be able to break that habit on your own. It's impossible. We're just not strong enough. So what we need is we need God to plant that word in our heart, which is able to save us. James says you're not going to be able to do it by yourself. You have to have some help, and that help comes from Jesus Christ. So let's talk about the, the how. Um, let's talk about the, the what before the how, okay? So we're going to talk about the what. So Craig Groeschel says you can't defeat what you can't define. And so what many of us do is we ignore the bad habits in our lives. We just kind of pretend they're not there. So if we ignore it long enough, we don't have to define it, and we don't have to do anything about it. But let me tell you this. If someone who you love, if, if two people that you love have told you that you have this bad habit, then that's a bad habit, and that's something that you need to break. It's kind of the litmus test. If two people that you love and that love you have told you, hey, you got this bad habit of gossiping, you got this bad habit of lying, you got this bad habit of tearing people down, whatever it is, then that's a bad habit that you need to focus on and you need to break. Because James says we need to get rid of every filthy habit and all wicked conduct. And the way we do that is through Jesus. Now, I think we should just start with one today. If you're like me, you probably got a few. Um, but if you kind of get overwhelmed, then odds are you're not going to deal with anything. And so if you could just where you're at, think of one bad habit that you need to break, then today will be the day that you'll be able to start breaking that habit. Now, we're not talking about habits that uh, are just kind of annoying. <laughs> we're, we're talking about habits that break your relationship with God, 
Habits that keep you from becoming the person that God created you to be. Uh, not habits like leaving your cereal bowl out on the counter instead of putting it in the, washing, or the dishwasher and then all the ants get in the cereal bowl in the morning and your wife is mad at you. We're not talking about uh, forgetting to change the air filters in your house for like two years. Uh, we're not talking about listening to your podcast too loudly in the house. Uh, if these seem oddly specific, there's a reason. Um, We're talking about habits that negatively impact your relationship with God, that negatively impact your relationship with his creation, and that negatively impact your relationship with other people. These could be habits, like I said earlier, complaining, gossiping, lying, lusting, wasting time, uh, not using your talent and your treasure appropriately. Anything like that is a habit that needs to be broken. So you may have noticed Over the past couple weeks, for some of you that took this seriously and you're you're trying to develop the habits of prayer and obedience and worship, you probably notice that it's really hard to do. Like, the more you try to to read your Bible, the more you try to commit yourself to coming to church on a Sunday, the more you try to pray, uh, even though you know that these habits are going to bring about great blessing to your life, oftentimes it's very hard for you to start them. And this is why. In my studies, I learned that that good habits have two qualities, delayed benefit and positive results later. Delayed benefit, positive results later. So you press on. It's Sunday morning. You get up to come to church, and you spill coffee all over your brand new tie before you leave the house. At that point, you have a choice to make. Do I just skip church that day? The day is ruined. Or do I go swap out my tie or maybe just not wear a tie to church that day? But if you press on, what you'll notice is over a period of time, you'll experience results. You'll be like, whoa, I had no idea that my relationship with my church and with my God could be this great. But it's that delayed benefit that often gets people. They want immediate results. Like that Sunday, they want to feel like they're walking on cloud. I came to church after I spilled coffee on my tie. And like the angels are going to be singing as you walk into the sanctuary. That's what we expect, but that's not how life works. It's a series of small, good, obedient decisions that you make over a period of time that lead to developing a habit. And when you develop the habit, then you experience the wonders that God has for you. That's why our theme verse for these last three weeks has been Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. If you would, let's say this verse together. We'll use the one that's up on the screen. Let us not grow tired of doing good, for we will reap at the proper time if we do not give up. Don't give up. I know it's hard. I know it's hard to develop these habits of prayer and obedience and worship, Uh, but one day I want you to just walk in here and be like, whoa, I had no idea that God was this real And what you'll do is you'll look back and you'll say, oh, this series of small steps where I just made it a priority to do these things. Finally, I'm in the habit of coming to church so much that when I miss church, then I'm excited. Then then I'm like broken. I'm like, whoa, this is weird. Like it's abnormal to not be here. It's abnormal to go a week without reading your Bible. It's abnormal to not pray. That's where we want to get. But what you will also notice is as you try to rid yourself of a bad habit, it's a totally different fight. So bad habits, bad habits, they have immediate perceived benefit. They give you what you want and they give it to you quickly. Immediate perceived benefit with negative results later. So sin can be fun. It's why Samson walked 56,300 steps to go toward sin. Sin gives an immediate perceived benefit. So for example, if you, if you vape, it, it relieves stress, and for some people it, it, it tastes good, but what you may not notice is that over a decade of vaping, it's going to come with some negative benefits. Your heart and your lungs are going to pay the price. If you take a season off of church, I was a youth pastor for 12 years, I've seen this over and over and over where uh, when students get into the high school ages and parents start doing everything else but coming to church and being a part of youth group and things like that, the, the, uh, there's an immediate benefit if you have more time to do more stuff. So it appeals to you in the moment. But what we've seen is that like 80% of students who take over two years off from the church during high school, they do not come back to church. They never join a, a church family again. Lust, it satisfies the flesh in the moment but it destroys relationships in the long term. 
relationships with your, with your spouse and with your family. See, understanding this dynamic is what's going to help you break bad habits. So developing a good habit, you make it easy, you make it obvious. Put your Bible on your pillow when you get up in the morning. That way you got to move the Bible before you go to bed. It's going to remind you, read the Bible like Daniel did. He had a prayer closet in his house. He had to walk by the prayer closet every day. And that prayer closet reminded him, it was easy and it was obvious, that he should, that he should pray. And so that's how you develop a good habit. But to break a bad habit, you have to make it difficult to do. To resist temptation. You can't, a lot of times in student ministry, I would get these questions from teenagers. They're like, how far is too far? I hated that question because what they're really asking is how close can I get to this line without going over it? How close can I get to temptation without taking that one little extra step over that line? Friends, the the Bible says that we need to get rid of every filthy habit and all wicked conduct, but it also says in James 1.21, submit to God and accept the word that he plants in your heart, which is able to save you. You can't save you. You can't resist the temptation on your own. You have to let God save you from it. So the best thing that you can do is to cut off that temptation at the source, because look at what, what the word of God says about us. Proverbs 4:14 4, and 15. If you don't get the point from this verse, I don't know what you're doing, okay? This is the most plain verse in all of scripture. Keep off the path of the wicked. Don't proceed on the way of evil ones. Avoid it. Don't travel on it. Turn away from it and pass it by. Saying the same thing six different ways like, "Hey Kevin, are you listening? <laughs> don't get near the sin. James Clear in his book, Atomic Habits, he he talks about how habits are formed. You have a a cue, you have a craving, you have a response, and you have a reward. You have a cue, like a trigger, you have a craving, you respond to that craving, and you experience a reward. So sometimes it's a good thing, sometimes it's a bad thing. But that cue or that trigger is what really starts you down the path to the good or the bad habit. And since we're talking about bad habits, we're going to focus on the cues that that lead us into the bad habits. The first one is time. You got to watch out what you do with your time. So if you do the same thing at the same time, it's going to build a habit. So if you take your smoke break at the same time, you build the habit of taking a smoke break at that time. If you get your phone out late at night and you look at inappropriate things, and you do that for a series of nights, then you've developed a habit at that time. Number two was location. This is your response to the environment. It's what happens when people drive by the ABC store, or when they they drive by their friend's house that throws all the parties, or when they go by Taco Bell, you know? You have this this location that triggers a reaction. Uh, It's also your emotional state. This thing called the the HALT principle that um, James Clear talked about. It's, It's when you're hungry, Angry, lonely, and tired. If you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, you're more susceptible to give in to temptation. And then, of course, there's people. You develop the habits of the people you hang around. I know I sound like my dad right now because I swear he told me this a million times. You develop the habits of the people that you hang out with. And he got that from Scripture, Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20. It says, The one who walks with the wise will become wise but a companion of fools will suffer harm. So we don't want to seclude ourselves from the world. We don't want to live in a little Baptist bubble and have nothing to do with the world around us. Otherwise, we can't evangelize and share the good news. So we don't want to do that, but we also don't want to become influenced by it either. And the best way to keep from being influenced by the world is to have best friends who kind of mirror the habits that you would like to have. So for example, my best friends all go to church. My best friends are all pretty generous people with their time and their money. My best friends are all pretty chill, and I like that about them. Those habits that they have have rubbed off on me. 1 Corinthians 15, 33, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Well, Gary Buzzard told me that all the time. Bad company corrupts good morals. So what do you do? Those are the cues. They lead you into the bad habits. So what do you do? You have to change the cue. So according to James, we we have to change the cue. So uh, for time, for instance, you have to fill that void. 
One of my best friends, his name was Billy, he, he, was, he started smoking when he was in middle school. When he was in high school, he wanted to try to stop smoking, but he took his, his smoke break at the same time every day. And so even when he stopped smoking, he, he'd still go out and take that break, and he wound up like chewing his fingernails off. He wound up going back to smoking sometimes. Um, and so what he had to do is he had to fill that time. And so he took a little bag of uh, those little baby carrots, and he, he would just chew on the baby carrots during the time that he used to take a smoke break. He was filling the void uh, that that time created. So if you're somebody that looks at inappropriate things at night at the same time on your phone, then what you do is you put your phone up in the living room and you grab a book and you read a book before you go to bed. If it's a location, then you just have to change your route. Drive by the gym <laughs> instead of Taco Bell. Take that road, you know? Let that be your trigger. Oh, hey, I haven't been to Planet Fitness in a while. I should go there and work out. If it's your emotional state, it's very easy. You should eat. You should pray. You should, if you're lonely, you call a friend. If you're tired, you go to sleep. It's just basic things. If it's people, then sometimes you just got to get some new friends. And I think this is probably the hardest one to do. I can change my route. I can change my routine. I can, I can eat and pray and call a friend. I can go to sleep. But sometimes it's really hard to, to kind of move some people out of your life that are causing you to sin. Uh, sometimes you got to block them on social media. Sometimes you got to take a break from them on Facebook. Sometimes you have to break up with them. Um, sometimes you, you have to take even more drastic action. Sometimes you have to, to go to rehab or to transfer schools or look for a new job or, like I said, break up with, with somebody. I remember two weeks ago, if you remember two weeks ago, we, we said that Craig Rochelle um, had this awesome quote where he says, the habits that you have today will shape the person that you become tomorrow. Small things become big things over time. You never expected to lose your job. You never expect, expected to become addicted. You, you, you never expected to lose your house or lose your family. But if you change the cue, then you can cancel the habit. And you say, I can't do this. And Jesus says, exactly. That's what I've been trying to tell you. 2 Corinthians 12, 10. For when I am what? For when I am weak. Very last sentence. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Christ who is in me is stronger than the temptations who are trying to influence me. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. No temptation has come upon you which is except what is common to humanity. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able in his strength. But with the temptation, he will also provide a way out so that you will be able to bear it. James says, so get rid of every filthy habit and all the wicked conduct. Submit to God. Submit to his word and you'll be able to break that habit. Literally, Samson could have taken 56,000 299 steps, and at that last moment, at the threshold of that doorway where sin laid inside, he could have turned and gone the other way. He had God. He had the ability, but he made a poor choice. So start with a habit, prayer, obedience, and worship. Make it easy, make it obvious. Break a habit, change the cue. Never underestimate how God can do something special with one small decision today. Zechariah chapter four, verse 10. Talked about this last week. I love this verse. Do not, this is the New Living Translation. Do not despise the small beginnings. Small things become big things over time. So every time you pray, every time you make your request known to God, every time you bring thanksgiving to him, you're changing your destiny. Every time you obey, even when no one is looking and you do the right thing, you're changing your destiny. Every time you come to church and you worship, you are changing your destiny. Every time you respond to someone in need, you're changing your destiny. Every time you say no to those sins, even if you've taken 50, what, 52,299, whatever, how many ever steps you've taken, it doesn't matter because you can still say no and change your destiny. Every small God-honoring habit that you make and every small sinful habit that you break are going to add up, and they're going to give you big life-enhancing benefits and changes over the course of your life that will help you to God-honoring success. Would you bow your heads for just a moment?
Lynn, if you'd play something. I just want to give you an opportunity to, to think about a bad habit in your life that you need to break. Maybe it's a habit that nobody else on planet Earth even knows that you have, but God does. And he knows that that bad habit is leading you into hurt and harm and danger, and he wants to have a more intimate relationship with you. He wants to help you break that habit today. But it's not going to be your willpower. It's going to be the power of God working in you. So the first thing you have to do is you have to develop these good habits, prayer, obedience, and worship. And then as you grow in your relationship with God, you'll have the power that you need to break the bad habits that are dragging you away from him. So I'm going to give you 30 seconds of quiet time where you can just think, meditate. And if there's something that God reveals to you, a habit that you need to break, I'm going to pray that he will give you power to do that. Father, reveal to us habits that we need to break, habits that we need to make, and help us be the people you want us to be. This time, if you would all stand and join me for a, a corporate prayer. We're all in this together. I don't want anybody leaving here feeling beat down or bad about themselves. And so we're all going to pray this prayer together. Whether God revealed a bad habit to you or not, it doesn't matter because we're going to pray this together as a, as a faith family. So if you could just close your eyes and repeat after me. Say, Heavenly Father, forgive all my sins. Change me. Make me new. Jesus, be the Savior of my life the Lord of my heart. Holy Spirit, fill me so I can follow you, live like you, show your love, do your will. My life is not my life. I surrender it to you. Thank you for new life. In Jesus' name I pray.